Well, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you in this virtual kind of way. Uh, we were not able to, to capture stories from the team while we were on the ground in Ukraine. And so we're having to do a little bit of that work on the backside uh, as we have re-entered the United States, uh, getting back into our work lives. Uh, so, so thank you for your patience, first of all, as, as you waited to hear from us. Uh, my name is Tom Boone. I'm associate director with the Outreach Foundation. Just led this fantastic team uh, into Kiev and further east in Ukraine to visit with our our host and, and gracious friends, uh, Dr. Ivan Rusin, his wife, Luda, and the team at uh, Ukrainian Evangelical Theological Seminary. And I am pleased to uh, honor, uh, delighted to be sitting here with uh, a pastor, uh, Rod Stone. And uh, Rod, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you as we travel to Ukraine. It was a great experience to be with you and the staff of Outreach Foundation with Mark and all the team. It was a wonderful experience of being brothers and sisters in Christ together. So thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I guess yeah, I'm, I've been a pastor for 39 years now. So I guess that makes wow. me a teaser. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been doing it for a while. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to serve Christ as we go out into the world. Well, Rod, we had you were a delight on the team. Really, kind of that energy that you bring uh, to your congregation. You brought it uh, to Ukraine. Appreciated that. Um, you know, this was your first trip into Ukraine, and you chose of all times to to get into Ukraine during a war, uh, and at a time during the war that things were not going Ukraine's way. Um, so, t help us understand how what was it like for you to think about this visit. Uh, ahead of it, and then maybe going into Ukraine. What are some of the thoughts that you had? Yeah, I think I'm still processing some of that, Tom, because, you know, God's at work, and sometimes you don't always see all the fullness of that fruit of God's presence until later. But I don't, if when I saw the brochure that you were looking for creating a team to go to Ukraine to do resiliency work, I had intrigue in that. I, as not only am I a pastor, I've been a law enforcement chaplain now for eight years. I'm trained as a certified crisis intervention specialist and in critical incident stress management. So I thought, OK, I would love to go and offer some of my passion and gifts and experiences in helping the folks over there um, do resiliency work and stress management. And that way, that's what I thought when I signed up. But then as the deadline got closer, I began to get anxious. I'll be honest. I was a little worried about going uh, into a war zone, also worried about just uh, leaving the comfortable nest of the United States into an unknown area of the world that I was not familiar with. And uh, I, I had questions and doubts uh, as I began to sign up. And then I sent an email to you, which was a wonderful uh, response that you provided for me. You listened to my anxiety, you you understood it, and yet at the same time, you brought in an insight that really transformed me. And you said, you know, nowhere in the scriptures are we called to be safe that you have seen, you know, that we're called to follow Christ, but that doesn't always mean that we're going to be doing that in the environment of safety. And that spoke to me. I said, yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. That, that, is, that is right. And, and so your your response back to me was very uh, helpful in my deciding to go on with the team. Well, in, in Rod, I was really glad and to, about your presence in particular, because you bring this this uh, the experience that you have among the police officers uh, where you are in. Is that Raleigh in that area yeah, and your experience as a as a chaplain there? When as let's let's think about the retreat just for a moment. And to what extent did that experience as a, a you know a chaplain for the police force trans how much of that was able to apply into these these people who are trying to be military chaplains without really any guidance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so Often in the United States, our training is to go into a critical incident. It's an event that happened that can uh, be pretty uh, traumatic, and we go in and help process that. What I found in Ukraine is it's not an incident. It's a daily encounter and experience. It's part of their environment. It's part of their world. So that was really quite out of the ordinary for how I've been trained. It's how do you deal with someone that's living this every day? Uh, in the trauma and the fears. And as you 
heard with some of our chaplains when we talked about what do you expect for tomorrow. Some of them said we don't have great expectations for tomorrow. One of them said we live 30 minutes at a time because that's how long it takes a missile to cross over from Russia into Ukraine. And so they're 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 thinking blocks, short blocks of time. And and so it's a very different frame of reference. And I think what I have been experiencing in my own uh, life or as a police chaplain. And that you know, I went over there, Tom, to think I could offer my gifts. Uh, and then I got over there and I realized, no, they have the gifts to offer. And if I just be still and listen, I can learn a lot from them. And, and indeed, um, they did have a lot to teach us. And I think we went over to teach them resiliency, but they're mm -hmm. already doing resiliency. They really are. And, and we saw that just all over the place. I think either you or one of the other team members used upon our final reflection, we saw resiliency. And I, I was interested during the retreat and, you know, folks at, at back home there, there were 43 military chaplains, small church pastors and their spouses who had been invited to this. And they really did not know what to expect because this kind of experience of retreat that we may be used to, they just don't have any framework for understanding. So uh, they, they really were uh, learning about how to do a retreat while we were bringing this uh, but Rod, you were you were in the back corner there the entire time, and and you were having a great visit. I, I don't know how much your folks were engaged in the material, but man, you were really engaged with that group. You had a group of uh, several people back in a table. Tell us a little bit about them. What did what what did you pick take away from all that? Well, they were all volunteer chaplains serving the mm -hmm. military. Um, so they are authorized by the military, and yet they are doing it as a volunteer basis. And so they would travel uh, a, a long distance to get to the front line, and they would often communicate through family members that were living or friends that they knew towards the front lines. They'd say, what do you need? We're coming your way. And they would say, fill the car up with this and bring the van supplies of this. And then they would, and then they would travel and be with the soldiers and offer uh, relief to the community. And so a dedicated group of, of men in this case, uh, serving, I was just impressed with their ability to, um, to serve Christ in the ways that they were. It struck me, Rod, Number one, it struck me their, their will to fight in this way. They were fighting Russia, not with the weapons, but with uh, their bodies, uh, saying, we're going to make sure that people can survive. And they were doing this on a volunteer basis. Did you, did you all talk through what that was like for them and how they came to understand that that was going to be their role and how it works um, we talked to some level about that, that they all have a strong commitment of serving Christ in this way. Matter of fact, one of the uh, chaplains was asked to leave his own individual church because they were mm. pacifist in that church and they felt that his connection to the military uh, was inappropriate. And so even to the sacrifice of giving up his own church community to serve, uh, he did. Um, and it was strong witness to the need to provide Christ presence in the midst of war. And we saw that again and again in so many different ways that uh, there, there was a will to live, but there was also a will to um, um, hold the light against the darkness. Mm. Um, and they yeah, and, yeah. And I know you brought some flashlights. <laughs> Yeah. Never made it. <laughs> Had some luggage problems that, that didn't quite make it to Ukraine. Well, it was going oh, to represent well. the, the scripture that we kind of held as a theme through the week that where it's you know, the psalm that says, I am the light, I am the salvation, and we are going to share the light. And so, but you know, the, the flashlights didn't make it, but the light was sure present and it shined Absolutely. brightly uh, in so yeah. many ways. It was so wonderful to see. Uh, there was uh, one younger guy. Um, what was his name again? He was a volunteer. He he wasn't wearing Anthony. Anthony. Yeah. So so know. one of the things that I was interested about his story is that he used to live in Washington State, and, and his you're... family. Uh, tell us a, just a snippet about that because he came back to Ukraine. 
Yeah, they came back pre-war, but he came back. But then he went to fight in the war um, and uh, continues to want to support that effort in, in that way. Uh, and one of the reasons I was sitting in the back is because he spoke English well, having lived in the United States. So I had a, a ready translator. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why I was back there. So he could whisper in my ear what was being said and what was uh, how, what was going on. So I had a good translator in that kind of way. What would you say, Rod, is something they would want us to hear? Well, I think the most powerful thing is that uh, we are with them. Um, I think, you know, there was education taught, there were exercises provided, but the biggest witness was our presence. And I think their their biggest witness is their presence uh, in, a, in a place that's devastated by war. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it was, I think Samuel Wells preached a sermon once. He said one of the most powerful words in scripture is with um, mm -hmm. Not doing for, but doing with. And that was the witness of this trip for me is that we were with them um, mm -hmm. in the midst of the suffering and devastation. We saw the church living out the call to be with one another. Absolutely. Uh, I saw it. You know, we say in the church it's compassion, which asks us to go where it hurts and to enter the places of pain. And, mm -hmm. and the church can't serve people without being among the people. And we have to walk the path with them. And, and they were. They were walking the path with the, the soldiers and with the villages, and we saw many relief efforts and humanitarian uh, aid being provided by the church because they were with the people. Even in the midst of danger, they were standing there with them. Um, and we saw a lot let's, of evidence. Yeah, let's reflect on that piece because one of the things that we've heard time and again from Yvonne, from other church leaders, uh, that we really hadn't seen examples of it with our own eyes and and touched it with our hands is how the church even though it's going through the same type of scarring that the society around it is they are managing to flourish they are blooming and faith is just uh is is being shared um they're meeting real needs and spiritual needs so we went out east everybody um uh further than any of us thought we would go and we we won't spell out the exact same the exact place, uh, but uh, it it was it was um, this tent church, and because the church building had been bombed out, and so now they had migrated to a tent, and we're staying. Rod, tell us just reflect on that with me, and I'll reflect yep. back with you as well. We were, I think, at one point, fifteen kilometers from the front lines, which is what eight, nine miles, and then it, it, when we were even closer. At a certain point, we went even a little further in, uh, so yeah. we were getting uh, quite close to the front line in that way. But here is a church right near the front line. The house had been bombed; it was demolished, and yet they come in and where the demolished home was and put up a tent to be a church. And he said, "We're going to start set our church here." And right to the side of the church uh, was a, a place where the uh, Russians had built artillery. Uh, station, and you can see the remains of that uh, artillery position right there next to the church. Um, and there we saw great relief of handing out food and and clothing and supplies. We even helped. We brought what? How many? Yeah. A couple of vans full of two vans full of stuff. Supplies to help store their for their storage closet so they could be distributed to the people in need. And then we went into an afternoon two o'clock. Was it two somewhere like that afternoon mm -hmm. uh, worship service where the tent yeah. was full of. I think the count was a little close to 150, 140 people all gathered and singing and praising God and listening to scripture and praying. And uh, yeah, so that to have a, a church planted right where there was um, uh, devastation and right where enemy, enemy presence was there just days or months pre is a, is a wonderful witness to the church. Yeah. One of the things that you didn't see around the church, but we had driven through, if you had been with us, everybody, is there were mine, the active minefields all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, it, it, and I remember seeing one, I don't know if you remember this, Rod, where there was one farmer way out there, yeah. and he's yeah. plowing his field, and there's minefields everywhere, like, they yeah. really are just saying, you know what, we're going to live, we're, yeah. we're going to exist, Budmo is, yeah. is the language. Yeah, the light of Christ is going to be stronger than the death in its many forms that it takes. Mm -hmm. That was a witness to me as well, that the, the church is going to remain. It's going to change possibly, and it's going to have some trials and suffering, but it's going to remain. It's going to be strong yeah. because the people believe in Christ, who is the conqueror. So very powerful.
Rod, Rod, I don't know if this in particular stuck out to you, but one of the things, the images that just I, I have buried into my conscious right now as I go back there is 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 then the pastor's up there and he's playing his guitar and then he gets into this kind of volunteer spirit and he says okay we need people to do this outreach and who all wants to do that and they you know people are starting to raise their hands and he said oh who wants who wants uh clothing you know not so many people but then who wants eggs they all raise their hands oh sorry we don't have eggs yeah. uh, so, you know the the sense of humor yeah right yeah. the sense of just these were not people yeah. that are down and depressed about their circumstance. I, what do you think? I agree. I agree completely. And so many of them are working so hard to kind of maintain a normalcy to life in the midst of a life that's anything but normal. You know, Tom, I think for me and what I'm still processing in my own uh, uh, work it, is this trip witnessed the suffering, the devastation, and the atrocities of war for me. Yeah. That I've never been in a country that is actively in war. I haven't been in the military where I've seen that kind of devastation. And so through the trip, we saw, we heard, we witnessed to the suffering that war brings in that way. So there's a caution that I find for myself sometimes, and maybe you have had to experience it or had to work through it too, that if you get exposed to too much human misery, we can get what I like Henry Nouwen calls, he calls it a kind of a, a psychic numbness. Mm. I found that happening to me at the beginning of the trip. I would see it, oh, there's another burned out building. Oh, there's another uh, building that's been destroyed. Oh, there is a wall that's been destroyed by machine gun and fire. And it was like a fact. These are facts. And there wasn't the emotion around it because I think it was my self-defense to kind of protect myself from such the, the sights of the human suffering. But then we went to, we were in Bucha. And Bucha, if you will remember, was a place where there was huge uh, human massacres. It was in Bucha where they began the war crimes uh, against Putin, uh, the mass grave, and the terrible, terrible witnesses of human suffering. And, and so when we were in Bucha, they had piled up cars as kind of a makeshift memorial um, of all the cars or many of the cars that had been destroyed uh, by the Russians uh, when they were beginning to evade Kiev. And when first I was looking around, I said, okay, there's another memorial of all these burned out, destroyed cars parked on one another as kind of a memorial. And I looked at it as just that, another memorial of cars. Our host uh, said, just off to the side, she said, that car over there was my neighbor's car. And it was shot up. And she said, he died in that car. It was at that moment that it began to hit me that this is not just um, another memorial of cars or another a witness of a home destroyed or a church destroyed. This is actually people. And, and, and I began to realize the human face of suffering in that way. And I began to, to feel in a, in a deeper way, of, you know, uh, people traveling down the road trying to escape maybe from the Russian occupation. Maybe they're going around the corner to go to the market to get provisions while they stayed in, locked in their home. Or maybe they just turned on the wrong street. These are just normal civilians that were killed by Russians. But they have become now the face of a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter or a granddaughter, a grandson. And for me, that became very powerful. Then we followed that up by going to the mass grave at Bucha. Mm -hmm. Again, we heard the priest say, you know, these are my members of my church. These are my neighbors. These are my friends. And, and, and so then the whole trip thereafter began to take on a little bit of a, uh, of a, a reframing for me. And it would begin to say, this is personal. This is people's lives. Um, this is, uh, it's not just another burned out building, it's someone's home. It's not just another business that's been destroyed, it's somebody's livelihood. Um, the memorials represent loved ones that are not going to return home. So there was great sadness, but in the midst of the sadness, that's where I saw the church coming in to provide the hope. And, and that was what, for me, was so rewarding. We went to a children's center where they're teaching the kids some trauma-informed care, you know, and how to, to, how to help, uh, help them process some of what they've experienced. And then we see these churches like you're referencing where they're just providing wonderful relief uh, for the community, even at their own threat. Um, and and it was it was to hold the suffering against the hope of the church and the action of the church was very powerful for me. Um, it reminded me again of the importance of what we said so often in our retreat, the incarnational theology of Christ yeah. being present. Uh, you know, and, it, and when Christ is present, and then if, if we can be there to represent Christ, then people, people can begin to see that God is also there and is present.
I don't know about for you, but no, that, I think that's a very appropriate, powerful word to, uh, to end on. I, I, I do want to, do you remember, since you mentioned these, uh, these kids, each of whom are internally displaced, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. at Raduka, which means rainbow, uh, sign of great hope uh, and, and new life. Uh, the, one of the thing, one of the stories that we heard, um, there was, there's a biblical story in, that is particularly powerful for this one girl. Do you remember what the, what that was? No, tell Daniel, me. Daniel, Daniel. Ah. So, yeah. So th for her family and they have become Christians through this, uh, they, they really found the story of Daniel and how this one, like the son of man came and, and um, protected them in the fire. Mm. Uh, and that for them is a very powerful image right now, that, that sense that God is with us. And, and Rod, as you discovered and mentioned, um, you know, being the face of Christ is a very humbling um, reality. And, and, and thank you for being the face of Jesus Christ just so many, uh, and 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 everybody. We look forward to rolling out more of these stories. Uh, you'll you'll see varieties. You'll see stories from people there uh, that we we captured. You'll see a lot of um, our team uh, doing some processing with you. Uh, Rod, thanks for Thank you. sharing. Well, you are doing great work at the Outreach Foundation and encouraging us all to keep a kind of a global perspective of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. So thank you for your work as well in terms of opening up the door for us to have these experiences. Absolutely. And it's such an honor to do it. Um, and and friends, if you uh, would like to hear more about uh, this, please go to our, our Ukraine uh, trip page. Uh, our director of communications, Jeremy Churchill, has done a great job to get those stories out for you. You can learn how to continue uh, adding fuel to the to the resources that they need. Uh, blessings on you. Blessings on your ministry, Rod. Uh, thank and thank you, everybody, for, for thank you. Uh, tuning in. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.